instance, um, from about now on, we won't water any of the outdoor trees at all. Yeah. We will still go on watering the trees in the greenhouses because you know, we stop the greenhouses from getting frozen and, and of course they can get pretty warm when the sun comes out. That's something, something to bear in mind also again about uh, protecting your trees in a greenhouse is that, that they can get pretty warm on a winter's day when the sun comes out. Um, but I find with the polytunnel there and I suppose greenhouse or whatever as well that you're not, you're still not having the water as well. I have had the water more of my trees outside than in the polytunnel because the wind is what's wind. drying them out, where in a polytunnel it's not. So yeah. the actual humidity that's created even with the heat means that the pots still aren't no. dry. Mm. Um, another thing with the amount of rain that we've had, maybe if you do have a mix that's holding quite a lot of water, and even if it's a free draining mix, you talk about free draining, but <coughs> a lot of that will come down to how good a drainage there is in the pot that you have. Because mm. a lot of pots are, if you tilt them, you know, even the day after you have watered through, if you tilt it and watch the water run out of it, that shows you just how much excess water is in that pot, even on a free draining, draining mix. So, you know, a lot of people talk about propping up one end of the pot over the winter, so that you know you're you're, you're not having that excess water, which I have never really done a lot of. But no, no, they're not. You can get the water jar one corner, and yeah. also especially if you're feeding organically, yeah. because obviously the fertilizer pellets are washing in through the mix. You actually, mm. although it's in a free general mix, you still get quite a lot of organic material. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, it, it's a little bit tricky, but it's. Uh, this is one of the instances where there's a there's a real danger of kind of almost overloading you with with information or or, or making it sound as though it's bloody near impossible to, to end up with a, doing the right thing. But you know so much of what Ian said is right that uh, you can start off um, you know this year, next year, last year, five years ago with a perfect free draining mix in a perfect pot. Um, but the drainage will steadily get poorer as the years go by. And um, I, I tell you a very significant thing that can affect the, 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 the free draining nature of the whole thing as a unit, and that's mycorrhiza. You know, people heard the word mycorrhiza, it's a, a fungal, a, a symbiotic relationship between a fungus and the roots that actually helps some, helps all trees, to be honest. It helps, seems to help more. Specifically, we think of it in terms of pines, uh, and suddenly um, there's a case to be made for the you know pines needing that symbiotic relationship to, to, to really thrive as well as they should do. But it, you know we've seen uh, such a growth of mycorrhiza in the Scots pine that the mycorrhiza colonizes the um, mesh that we put over the drainage holes and impedes them. It never quite makes it watertight, thank goodness, but it certainly diminishes the free drain in nature that we've been striving to keep. So, and, and Ian very, very rightly says that if we use, and we certainly do, an organic fertilizer on the top surface of our very free draining mix, then and some of that washes down and, and doesn't decompose completely. And, and the other thing is that, you know, Again, we start off with a beautiful free draining mix, but some of the components in that mix, particularly, and you know, we do this if you're using Akadama, Akadama breaks down. You know, we've had some debate this morning before we got going about the problems with sourcing the very best Akadama now in Japan. Um, and in the past, Akadama's had a bit of a bad reputation, in part because. Uh, um, some of the poor akadamas have been brought into, into this country from Japan. Akadamas that are, have not a very, very hard particle uh, to them and, um, and break down very quickly. Um, where was it I saw on the internet recently? Or was it you? Something to do with you. Somebody buying a, a cheap cat litter that broke down very, very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you buy the wrong one. People go yeah, and right. buy, buy their own. Yeah. Thing. It's, it's easy know, enough to do too, but... If it's, the, if it's the right stuff, it's oh, 20 yeah. times harder than what I could Yeah, yeah. You want, you know, I mean, uh, some debate about whether you want all of the particles in your mix to be uh, impossible to break down. You know, there's some argument for saying uh, that the very process of things breaking yeah. down within your brain mix is, is a way of helping the roots maintain health and vigor. 
but they, they would set that against the downside of impeding impeding drainage. So yeah, there's a lot of still. I mean, the thing is, nothing about bonsai is a precise science. Um, um, I'm pretty certain that not, I mentioned this earlier on at some point. <coughs> there's nothing even in botany that's a particularly precise science. You know, I think I mentioned that having bought my son's uh, degree level botany textbook when he was finished with it and the fact that so many of the paragraphs in this great fat book written by you know absolute experts on botany were saying we think that uh, or it is supposed to that, uh, that, that, that those paragraphs littered the book so it's quite clear that there was still so much in, in the activity of these seemingly relatively simple plants that actually the experts don't still fully understand. So I'm afraid there's not much hope for us poor bonsai people to, to fully grasp some of those nuances on, in the way that the, the things are going on with our trees. Um, but um, certainly, uh, um, yeah, it's, it, again, the only thing you can do is, is try to look at your trees, you know, um, you know, we all do bonsai to whatever level we do it at, uh, because, uh, you know, we like the idea of doing bonsai, but uh, you, you kind of need to look at your trees if you're going to get any any results from them at all, really. Um, so. um, no light level on the citrus trees isn't a major factor for the garage. What about uh, evergreens, pines? Yeah, pines, yeah. I think that... Um, most of our evergreen species are not going to be seriously impacted by um, a period of even as long as three weeks in a fairly gloomy garage. Uh, three months would be a different issue altogether. Um, trees grow in lots of different environments naturally in the wild. Um, and in those different environments, have to cope with a variety of different situations uh, and one of those would be um, uh, light levels. For instance, I've got out there, which I think is a really nice uh, western hemlock bonsai, uh, very reasonably priced, and um, when I, when I uh, began my forestry training, again the, the very first session I, I, I talked a little bit about um, uh, you know my background and how I got into bonsai but I, I trained as a forester and I remember at forestry college when we dealt with a range of tree species used for, for forestry the western hemlock Suga heterophylla uh, was we were told it was a shade tolerant tree so it's a tree that we could underplant used to be an underplanting species under you know an existing uh, big woodland species that we'd thinned out so light levels would be relatively poor, but the western hemlock would, would cope with it quite well. Um, whereas most of our pine species wouldn't cope with the light levels of that uh, so well. So um, even, even that, it's not a simple thing of saying uh, all the coniferous species um, are, are going to be unhappy with, with low light levels. And, um, and, but, Another turn that on its head, Ian. Uh, a, a way of looking at it is: Are your coniferous species better off being frozen to death outside, or suffering a bit through lack of light in your garage? I think there's a. You might, you know, neither might be an ideal situation, but one is going to be the lesser of two evils, really. And and that's, to be honest, that's where. Um, a polytunnel or a cold greenhouse, um, or even a heating greenhouse for that matter, might come into its own, of course. Um, so if it's going to be a long winter, like last winter, try to get uh, them out during the day, or some of them out during the day, so the yeah, uh, I think that's, that's, you're going to have to make that judgment when the weather comes. Um, generally speaking, um, I wouldn't have thought it was a particularly good idea to keep on a daily basis, the tree inside <laughs> and then back in at night time and then out again. Maybe that's going to be a solution to a problem if the winter goes on and on and on and on. Um, again, not ideal, but it might be the lesser of two evils in that situation, really. Um, but um, 
even if we get a really bad winter, I mean, we are fairly unlikely to get three months continuously of minus 10. Actually, if that happens, I think all our trees have had it. <laughs> so no, never mind us, us poor humans as well. But uh, So um, it, it might just be a case of three weeks then and then a couple of weeks out again. If it turns cold again, then put them back in for another couple of weeks and, and on that basis. I'm afraid a lot of it's going to be suck it and see because um, you remember I, I, um, again, I'm sorry if I keep on referring back to things that we've dealt with remember at some point we talked about the differences between bonsai in this garden here and bonsai in a garden maybe on the other side of Newton Ards down near the lock something like that I mean I don't know whether anybody's got trees down there but I mean the point being that they the, the two gardens could be very, very different in terms of, of the, the mean temperature during a, a cold, frosty weather. You know, one could be a desperate frost hollow, and the other might be, um, you know, the, the simple topography of the land, its exposure to the wind, whatever, could be completely different in terms of the cold, cold air being continually swept away from the garden. So, you know, again, maybe it doesn't help you in the sense that it makes it sound an awful lot more complicated, but actually it's really just about thinking and about and observing. You know, if your garden is clearly a place where frost tends to dwell, then maybe you've got to think a little bit harder about the protection of your trees than somebody who lives somewhere where, where frost is not nearly, it's still going to get frozen, but it's not quite the same degree of intensity. Move face. Move face. Move health. Like to the Mediterranean. Or something. Always a good option if you, you know, for very wealthy people like you. I mean, you could pack all your stuff in your new boat and just, and just sail off. away <laughs> to the sunset. Well, I know we're looking at last winter. Uh, the greenhouse and the polytomer pack, they didn't lose anything over the winter, but there was other stuff that I left outside underneath benches, you know. I think the hardier things that could be alright and once it got the sort of the the first full week of minus 10 or whatever you're starting to think uh, even they aren't going to be happy here yeah. I started just lifting whatever I could snap off the benches because they were frozen solid under the benches snapped them off and brought them in here but they, were, they weren't thawing out but there was no wind around them yeah. you know it makes a difference even if they're still frozen solid in the pot in the garage at least they're, they're protected um, from the wind very significant um, that. Yeah, yeah the wind was oh, because oh, of that.